Hi, my name is Sam Johnson and I'm a voice teacher. Today I'm here with Jakir King. How would you describe yourself? I'm a producer, engineer, music creator. Yeah. And what's your favorite color? My favorite color? Ah, <laughs> uh, blue. Cool, cool. <laughs> so we're just going to ask a few questions about how to get the best, sure. the best home recordings of vocals. So some of these are ones that I came up with and some of these are things that you guys came up with. So I'm super excited for this. So number one, what's the ideal positioning of the mic relative to the mouth or does it depend on what style of vocals we are recording? Like how close does it need to be? Uh, style of vocal... Only occasionally, I guess. I think if you were doing something that, that was more to, meant to sound more classic, y you would just observe more older recording techniques, older traditions where the mic was maybe up a little bit higher and away from the vocalist, mm. um, like the way you might see of uh, Frank Sinatra mm. singing at Capitol Records or something. But uh, typically, you know, somewhere around the nose, upper lip, you know, for where the, the diaphragm is, you know, mm. uh, to sing into. It depends also on the, some people, some people like to, you know, kind of look up or down. Yeah, this tilt, like, I, I don't ever recommend for people to look up for records and stuff, but it, there's actually something to just having this little bit of a tilt up that helps a lot of people. It helps open, I guess, help open up things. It just depends on someone's comfort. So I typically just kind of put it at this level and then adjust from there. I had a, had somebody in the studio recently that liked to spread their legs out really wide, so it kind of made them shorter, so uh -huh. we had to move the mic down a little bit. <laughs> I guess it was just like just a sort of a habit from being on stage. So I'm sorry, you asked me about mic position, and then... Yeah, and just like how far away. Oh, oh, um, well, typically uh, I always like to put a, a windscreen, a pop filter mm -hmm. in front, and I usually try to keep it like two to three inches away from the mic just to kind of create a little bit of a buffer so that when if the singer wants to get close, they kind of have a boundary to not get too close. Um, and then and they can go like as close to that as they need. Sure, sure. And then um, other than that, typically they're a few inches away from that. So totally like six or seven inches away from the microphone. It depends on the vocal performance, like how loud someone is singing. Um, and you know, as you get closer to a microphone, you get more low end, you get a proximity effect. So there's there's definitely some variables, but variables, but that's the place to start. That's sort of the general rule of thumb. You kind of go from there. That brings us to number two: singing volume. Do you have to self-moderate? What sing, what singers need to do in the booth? What we need to do in the booth? Um, well, I just encourage someone to feel comfortable. I try to not give uh, someone who's performing too much to think about. Mm -hmm. I try not. I don't really have a set of parameters that you got to do this for me to capture the vocal. I try to work really hard to choose the right microphone, the right, the right signal path, um, and, and adapt it to them. You know, try to, try to meet them where they're at and then take that as far as I possibly can. And then from that point, maybe ask for some specific things like, hey, can you move back from the mic or can you get closer? And you have to pay attention to that also like when you're punching vocals in, like if, you're, if you've got a vocal performance and you just want to like drop a line in, You've got to be you've got to be aware of how that sounds and making sure that they're at a similar sort of relationship to the microphone when you're dropping that in. You know, if they're singing singing kind of loud in a way, well, then you want to have that same relationship. You don't want them singing loud and closer because it will change not only the 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 level, the volume, but it'll change the tone. So it's just constantly monitor it. It's constantly it monitoring. You know, it's like the other day. Um, well, a few weeks ago, another project I was working on. Um, the singer, he was, he's in of the vocal booth at my studio, um, and it's fine for most vocalists to be in there with the door closed, mm -hmm. but his voice was so loud that it was, and it, you know, it's a smaller space, so it's so loud in that space that it was, it, it was almost confusing his ears. It was just like it was too much sound for that little space. So what I ended, what what really worked is I opened the door up and propped the door open to let some of that sound and volume that he was creating in that space out because it was kind of confusing his pitch, mm. you know. And that's another, that's another thing that, um, a little, little thing that I've discovered over the years. If someone is singing sharp a lot, typically their voice is too loud in their headphone mix. Interesting. Compared to the music. Mm -hmm. Because if, they, if, they, if they're singing and um, they, all they start to hear is the pitch of their voice, over, and and the music kind of becomes too much of the background. Sometimes you'll get a thing where they'll kind of just be singing sharp, little, just a little bit sharp. Hmm. I'm not really sure why that happens, um, but that's also why sometimes it's good for you ask a singer to take one ear off, 
so that they can hear themselves in more of a natural way. I can't record if I'm if I can't hear myself in the room. Right. It just feels way too weird. So so it's kind of it, it kind of I think it relates to that, like mm -hmm. he hearing yourself more naturally in imbalance with the environment. Three main things vocalists can do to make us sound like it was recorded, not at home. Most importantly, be careful about the space you're recording in. Make sure that there's not too much room tone. Mm. That you're not. There's a you know we we want to be in a space and have a little bit of reinforcement of tone, but you don't want to hear the space too much. Like if you were trying to do um, like now singing in the bathroom is great. Singing in the shower is great because you're getting all that bright reflective information back, and it makes you it it gives you the sensation of a louder, fuller voice, um, but you wouldn't want that in a recording, mm -hmm. unless that's specifically what you're trying to do. So the things to be mindful of are, um, uh, you know, being being a, a balanced distance from the mic, but then also the space that you're in, um, making sure that it's not contributing to the sound of the vocal. You know, like if you're recording at home in your bedroom, uh, maybe if you have some curtains, you know, over a window, you know, you can draw the curtains over a window, put your back to the curtains so that the microphone is facing, well, it's obviously facing you, but the curtains are behind. Mm. And so the, the reflected sound of the space is not going into the microphone. Um, pulling the mattress off your bed and leaning it against, up against the wall and, you know, and, uh, and singing in front of it in the same way so that you have, you're controlling the sound that's going into the microphone. If you're in a nice space with a nice microphone, uh, it, you, you, it's not that you don't want that reflected sound. You don't. You do want some room tone. You don't want it devoid of that. But you just got to mm -hmm. be careful to not have it too much, so that it sounds like um, it's overly contributing to your vocal. I mean, uh, a lot of artists, especially now that are recording vocals on tour and on the road, um, when they're in a hotel room, that's what they do. They pull the they pull the mattresses off the bed and put them in in a V, and you know, and and get in oh, there so, so cool. <laughs> get, and get in there so that it's a dead space. I know a lot of people record in closets yep. with just tons of clothes, clothes around. around. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, that's exactly what it's about. And but then also, if you're let's say you're singing in your bedroom, find the best spot to sing in your bedroom. Maybe it is the closet, but maybe you maybe you don't have that. And you know, don't sing near the window if you don't have drapes. You know, go sing over near your bookshelf where there's stuff to absorb the sound. It's all so dependent on each individual situation. It's like you kind of have to develop the skills just like developing how to sing and everything. Absolute, and it's, absolutely. Yeah, I think people a lot of times are looking for just a one size fits all and it's not like that. So you have to just listen a lot. Yes. Yeah, it, it's all. Yes, it's it's all situational and you have to you have to do some work to figure it out in the same way that you need to figure out how to perform a song. You need to figure out how to capture a song. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Number four. What items are good to splurge on and where can you save money? I think the thing that's the most important, if you're recording at home, a good microphone uh, and a good um, preamp interface. Mm. Uh, what do you think of like USB mics? I think that they are great utilities. Uh, they lack a bit of f open fidelity that's mm. you know you can get you can capture a good vocal that will it, you can if you have a compelling performance anything will sound great that's the that's the number one thing while the while the microphone and the technology and all these things are important they are generally the difference between you know a, a demo recording and a like what you would want to put out as a record a great performance trumps all of that um, it can sound pretty mediocre um, but you know, if you have a great performance, then that's what sells it. I, I think USB microphones are just—they're very—they're very functional and convenient, but they don't have the f the fidelity that you would want ultimately for uh, a finished record. And it kind of goes back to what I just said: is like it's a skill that you have to work on. So don't let your lack of equipment limit the fact that you still need to learn how to like perform when you're doing this. And as you do that and record it and practice all of this, you'll work that skill up so that it matches your ability to perform and you can really start capturing what's awesome. Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, I reiterate it, the performance and learning to perform is way more important than the equipment. Mm -hmm. Good equipment is important, but it's, it's secondary. It is just, the, it's, you know, with a camera, with a decent lens, you can you can take a pretty compelling photo. Mm -hmm. If you have a better lens, you can you can take a, a compelling photo that has more detail and but resolution. It doesn't, to, it doesn't teach you composition. No, it does no. It's that stuff is all secondary. Do not think that because you go spend a lot of money on a microphone or whatever 
that it's going to make you a better vocalist. That that comes from within. Mm -hmm. So where could you save some money? I wouldn't uh, go out and spend a lot of money on a compressor. I would, you know, there's a there's a lot of opportunities to use um, really great plugins. You know, uh, Universal Audio. They, you know, they they have the Unison stuff, which there's a l tremendous emulations of a lot of the vintage gear that we use uh, in the studio um, that sounds spot on. And, and you, you can know, get like all of the stuff yeah. that fills a room in just a little computer now. It's yeah. insane. So the microphone's important and the performance is important. Don't go spend three thousand dollars on a compressor right right away. You know, that's maybe for the future. Maybe I don't know. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the stuff in the computer is pretty good. So. What would be more cost effective, a DIY studio or hiring one? And are there any situations where you would recommend like, yeah, you should go into a studio? I think money is better spent in a, until you until you are really sure of the the direction of a track and you have the performances on lockdown and you feel confident with what you're doing. Uh, I think a, you know a smaller scale studio is the way to go. Um, because really what it comes down to is time mm. and you want to you want to be able to spend as much time to experiment and learn and and craft like I have very good friends of band moon taxi they spend a lot of time in their own studios kind of working on things and they get the record to a point to where it's they they just hire a, a expensive studio for maybe a week mm. and they have kind of a list of well these are the things that we want to record in the big studio with all of the the, the gear and the big the bigger sounds and get a get a professional engineer in um, and do that I think that that money you have to be very careful with that you could spend f probably f three four five times the amount of time in an independent studio like a DIY studio mm -hmm. or at home and then take take that those tracks to a bigger studio and and you know get a lot of work done quickly what softwares do you recommend for Windows and Mac users? I'm not very knowledgeable about Windows. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I think I think I I'm a Pro Tools user, mm -hmm. um, and I think pretty much everything is suitable for um, both platforms. Um, what 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 software? Um, well, I'm a Pro Tools user. I wish there was something a little bit better. Um, I like I love. Um, I uh, love a lot of the UA uh, plugins. There's the um, Valhalla reverbs, um, surgical EQ sometimes, like Fab Filter is great. Um, Sound Toys make some really fun stuff. It just it just depends. Um, but uh, you know, having it, it just if you have a DAW that you're comfortable in, whether it's GarageBand, I, or I don't even GarageBand is a thing anymore. It is, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, Logic or GarageBand, whatever, where wherever you can be creative. That's what's the most important. People have made hit songs with Fruity Loops. Yes. Like oh, you absolutely. can, it doesn't matter what the tool is, it's how you use it. The tools are very secondary to creativity, mm -hmm. vision, and performance. And lastly, how do I soundproof properly in a townhouse? At the moment, I'm belting into a pillow to spare the neighbors. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if it's for practicing at home or for recording at home and stuff. Yeah. If you're practicing at home, there is a device. It's called a belt box. You can get it for like 50 bucks on Amazon and it muffles the sound. Uh, you, you basically sing into that instead oh. of the pillow. So I think it's a really good practice tool just like that. But a lot of my students sing in cars. Like that's oh, where that's... they practice like 95% of the time is driving back and forth. I think that that's really good advice because I mean to soundproof a townhome. I mean that's a that's a really really big undertaking. Some of the advice that we've already talked about, just in terms of shut the curtains, you know, d deaden things down in much, as much as you can in the environment. Otherwise, you're just talking about a lot of expense. I think the car is a really good idea because I mean a car is designed to eliminate road noise, engine noise, and you know the uh, so it's it's a kind of a good acoustic environment. It's very tight. I think that the biggest problem with singing in a car is you don't get feedback. You don't get to well, monitor yourself. And so a lot of people end up over singing just to try to compensate because they're used to singing in a liver room mm -hmm. and they just don't get the same thing. That's why you really need to focus on what it feels like, which going back to this other video we did, we talk about singing in terms of what it feels like mm -hmm. about almost all the time because there's no other way to really talk about it as it pertains to how do we change things? So if the feeling is the same when you're in the car, then you're probably getting a similar sound. But if right. if you feel like you're pushing in the car, don't. Cool. Do you have any other uh, just random things that help people get 
a decent sound at home. I guess the thing that I would say in, in wrapping up is that once you've recorded something, take it out into the world and listen to it, out in the, like listen to it in your car, listen to headphones, share it with a friend, get a feeling for how it sounds out there in the world. That will help you take some information back home and make some adjustments there about how you're doing things, how you're capturing things. Don't do it all in a bubble until you are to the point that you uh, are very confident uh, and, and sure about what it is that you're doing. Cool. So I think my main takeaways are that you need to start. <laughs> now, yeah. It's just practice. Uh, like everything in music, it just goes back to practice. And that's what you have to do. So go practice.